Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Science Bridge webinar series, Bigger Half Full. And today my guest is uh, Liesl Marie Reed. She is a professional coach that has experience working with students. So Liesl will be also a part of our coaching network. Hello, Liesl. Hi, Martina. Thanks so much for having me. And it's absolutely lovely to talk to you again. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure. You've been my coach before, and uh, now we are working together. So I'm very excited to tell our viewers about your coaching techniques and what you specialize in. Sure. Um, so yeah, so actually where we could really start off is just to say, what is coaching? Because there's so many definitions out there, and there's so many types of coaching. And um, basically, the type of coaching that I really follow is a complete amalgamation of performance coaching, career coaching, um, creative coaching is actually my little specialty, um, especially diverse in thinking, getting to look at all the possibilities and um, yeah, and then really just getting into the space where the student is and then being that support structure, soundboard, support structure, um, accountability partner, thinking partner, so yeah. Yes, I definitely experienced the accountability partner, but it is quite stressful sometimes. And um, that's what I wanted to actually ask you about. So, so coaching, you say it's a support structure for a student. So how does it help students? What students can actually come to you with as a problem? Hmm. So you see, the thing is, is that it's a support structure because it actually forms part of their system. So obviously students have supervisors that support them. And they've got um, some access to, to, to some lectures or <laughs> lots of academic articles and, and, and people, participants that they have to interview or surveys that go out. So there is some support structure for students from the university side. But the thing is what happens on the personal side. So who's accountable for making sure that the student actually makes the deadlines or actually produces very good work? Um, so there's a little bit of self-motivation becomes a, a thing. So it's a support structure in terms of motivation um, and getting that accountability partner going, partnership going. So if, if you know you've got a deadline according to your program or to, according to your supervisors, but what happens in between those deadlines? Or what happens in between those spaces of creating between the literature review chapter and the research methodology chapter? Um, and it's also an emotional support. But if it's emotional support, it's not a psychological support. You are not a shrink. You are not a psychologist, are you? No, no, not, not at all. And there's a very, very clear boundary to what is therapy and what is coaching. So coaching is really something that focuses on the future. It focuses on the development. So it's really, it's future oriented. It's, it's making sure that there's a presence. So you work on the presence and you are uh, you the present time and then you work towards the future. So therapy is a little bit more de delving into the past and coming up with any other certain traumas or anything like that that could come. But that's, that's really where the line needs to be very, very clearly um, put down where there is no boundary towards going into a therapeutic space. If there is, I mean, some students, um, I mean, myself, I was seeing a therapist and I was doing my master's and um, because of the anxiety and things like that, but I also had a coaches during my master's program where that helped me. So it's, it's really, it's a different angle, it's a different perspective and it's more future oriented. So it's to really get person to, to empower them to perform and to help motivation levels, engagement with the content and the studies and yeah, but it's not therapy. You're 100% right. So uh, one other distinction that I would like to point out in this is that you are also not necessarily a scientific mentor because I know you can work with science students, but you don't have to have a science background. Is that right? 100%. So basically the content that the student brings to the sessions 
that's for them to really work out. And it's really, I'm just a guide that helps them to think a little bit broader, think a little bit deeper about their content or about the situation that they're in. Um, it does help for me, having gone through my own master's program and about to embark on the PhD journey, I do. I am aware of the processes and, and it, sometimes it helps to know what, what thematic analysis is or if it's a personal component analysis or the stats, it does help. But I'm not there as a mentor to actually then say to students what there is. I'm not a replacement for a supervisor. I'm basically just there to, to spark curiosity, to spark thinking. Um, and if there's challenges, and often there are always challenges, what, what does this challenge mean to you? And how could we possibly get or work through the challenge to get to the solution or to get to the to the deadline um, in, a, in a good, you know, and, and produce quality work. Okay, so, so the challenges that people face at the university will be one thing is to meet the deadline. And especially now with pandemics, when we are sitting home and um, mindlessly scrolling through Facebook or other platform, and we don't really focus on the goal, the deadline, and we procrastinate way too much. So that's what coaching is assisting with. But what other challenges uh, can people face, um, especially when it comes to, to academic performance? So I think, um, let's take in the scientific community. So almost all my students that I was coaching, um, you included, couldn't get access to the labs, for example. So it really pushed the entire timeline out by three, four months. So basically what we do is we reframe that whole situation. Say, so, okay, what is still in your control? So we really focus on the locus of control. So what is still in your control? Okay, you can't get to the lab, but there's surely there's other aspects that you could be working on. And what are those aspects? Is it maybe the literature review that you need to finish? Um, is it maybe working a little bit on your research methodology chapter? already trying to piece uh, data analysis, doing all those data analysis for the data that you already have. So it's really looking at what is currently in your control and what can you currently work on so the time doesn't get wasted. Um, but it, it was easier said than done, I must say. Um, it was really digging deep for a lot of students and and becoming creative in a, in a sense. Um, I know some of my students actually ended up transferring their knowledge or, or their thesis writing and make, producing articles out of it just to keep going into that mindset, keep, keep that mindset going, get some motivation happening there. So it was really almost pivoting the whole process and the whole journey and making it work within the most dire times I think we've ever seen. <laughs> No, definitely. I, I personally experienced working with you and I know that um, you are a specialist in teaching how to think outside the box and focus on what's still in your control, but also uh, trying to reposition yourself and, as I'm saying, thinking outside of the boxes, that divergent thinking that you're specializing in. So how you're getting people to do um, use the divergent thinking technique. So there's actually a whole process about it. And um, so there's a lot of precursors that have to happen. So it's basically really getting that foundation. First of all, in coaching, you have to have a solid foundation of trust and confidentiality. So you, it, it's all the coach's job to make sure that the, the coaching space is absolutely a safe space. It's, it's ethical. It's Basically, it forms, um, falls under the components of what makes coaching coaching and, and really creating that safe space for, for clients to become vulnerable, to feel safe and to feel like they can really share and open up. So when you've got that opening um, experience for, for clients, then basically it also it, it defers the whole judgment and assessment. So, And I know with supervisors, it's, it's often a lot of constructive criticism that you face, which is always it's good because it pushes you as a student. But when you're in a coaching session, it's not really constructive criticism, but rather being able to say what you want, think what you want without me going, oh, I don't think that's a great idea. It would rather me being probing and saying, do you think that's a great idea? Do you think this is the best idea that you can come up today? What other possibilities are there? Are there any alternatives that you can think of? What is the craziest option if there was really, if 
if time wasn't an issue or money wasn't an issue, what was the what would be the craziest idea you can come up from? And then work back from there, because it could really just spark other insights that you might not have thought of. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. That sounds very interesting. But you're touching upon a very interesting topic as well when it comes to student-supervisor relationship. And I think that we should also talk about that, that you can help uh, overcoming constructive and um, not so constructive criticism as a coach. So um, how you can teach people to overcome, for instance, being um, kind of depressed by the bad criticism receiving from, from the supervisor. Yeah, that is actually, it's, it's really a difficult topic. Um, I mean, going through my own process last year, I had two fantastic supervisors. Um, and, and the one supervisor was really, it was quite, it was tough critique, but it was at the end of the day, it, you have to look at the intention of the critique. Um, what are they actually, I don't think it's in, always in a malicious way, although it's negative critique and it's a form of rejection that you personally feel when you read that. But it's actually also helping the, 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 the student to really work through the critique and say, okay, let's just take the emotions to a side. Let's just take the personal aspects to just push it aside and let's see what is it actually that your supervisor is trying to convey here. What is the guide that the guideline that they're trying to pr promote here? And it's a lot of times it is difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not the supervisor's um, responsibility to change their attitude or the way that they communicate. It's actually the, the, the student's responsibility to find a way that they can work with a supervisor in, in the most constructive way, absolutely um, find a way of that works for both sides. But it's really difficult. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of students that complain about the, the supervisor gives very slow, like is very slow to give feedback. So, okay, great, that's fine. And it is a challenge for you as a student, but how can you make this work? How can you find a platform that you can still get from your supervisor, even though it's slow to respond? That now that you know that they're slow to respond, how can you be smart about it and really work around that? Um, because at the end of the day, the supervisors also have jobs and they also have their own families and, and, and other things that are pressing. So it's, it's also getting to, in, you know, to connect with the fact that the supervisor is also a person at the end of the day. But it's for you as a student to navigate, how do I work with a supervisor? And that's where I also help a lot. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, it, it comes down to actual problem solving. So there's a challenge that's presented, whether it's the supervisor that's slow to respond or always critical, well, then find a way to to either rebut, <laughs> you become a rebuttal, so you, you have an answer. I think um, my one supervisor last year probably got quite fed up with me because I always said, yeah, I, I, I hear you, but how about this? What this other article said this? Can we maybe see if we can find a common ground there? Um, but yeah, so, so it's not just always about um, supporting the journey, but it's also supporting the student in their system that they're in. So who is the system? It's the supervisor, it's the university, it's maybe colleagues, fellow students. And that's also something that's quite interesting is that there's always this comparison. Um, oh, but my, my one, my fellow PhD student is already on her last chapter and I haven't even started with my literature review. That also gets quite, you know, nerve wracking. Um, so really just to, to gain clarity in most of these challenges. And that, that is always helpful for a lot of students. Um, but that's something also that you're touching upon. So it's interpersonal communication. And um, basically, university consists of more than just students. So I wanted to uh, ask you, can coaches help supervisors as well? to supervise their students? Because I think um, a lot of us come to university and we focus on ourselves and our own plate, so to speak. But the truth is that we are all having certain backgrounds. And I think sometimes supervisors might not be able to overcome certain challenges with understanding students. So can coaches also help with that and trying to see 
you know, other side of the coin and help getting help as a support structure from coaches. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure that coaching could definitely help. Look, coaching is, is for me, such a powerful um, profession because at the end of the day, what you are trying to achieve is to empower people, whether they are a student, whether they are a, a supervisor, whether they're an entrepreneur, you want to empower people to think for themselves and work through their own challenges. So yes, I'm sure that if a supervisor goes and, goes and sees a coach to help them navigate their relationships with their, with their, with their students, to get, overcome their work challenges and their responsibilities, yeah, definitely. Um, and a, a thing is with coaching is also that I work a lot with is the work-life balance. Even though we are working from home, we still have to find a balance. There still has to be a balance. Um, I mean, I was doing my master's with two li little young kids. Um, my baby was three months old when I started my master's. And I'm married and I have a house. And, you know, it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of pull, pulls um, from a lot of places. And you kind of have to wear a lot of hats. So being a student, I could see definitely coaching helped me but I think from if you have to flip the the tables I think yeah from a supervisor definitely it could definitely help it depends on what the challenges are and what the the, the supervisor needs out of the coaching no I, I understand I mean uh, on every part of our personal journey and career development there are different challenges and I think supervisors are facing a lot of pressure as well to to keep their lab going their students going and as you're saying the personal life that pulls on them probably quite a bit I haven't been a supervisor myself but I believe that that might be the case <laughs> so um mm -hmm. yes I think that's Basically, the coaching and the interpersonal communication that coaches could give training in that could definitely help. So uh, going back to your style, I just wanted to ask you, so how first three sessions, how would you describe with your clients? What do you do on those sessions? So I always believe in the beginning from the beginning. So really getting that foundation, that foundation properly and, and, and getting that quite clear. So I always start with what is what is important for the student. And I always ask the question, why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> why are you doing this PhD? And it's quite a hard question, especially if you're in your last year of PhD and you're not enjoying it maybe as much and you don't really want to go back into the academic world as a lecturer or any of that. Then that's a very hard question, but it's a very it's a vital question to go, but why did you? What was it that drove you to, to apply for a PhD scholarship or to apply to do a PhD and really just getting my, maybe, you know, getting back to the basics. So let's say maybe you wanted to know more about the topic because you're passionate about the area. Okay, great. But now you don't want to go into academia with it. Where do you want to go with it? And often the question is, I don't, or the answer is, I don't know. And that's something where you will not know until you've got that foundation. So my first three sessions, well, actually, my first session is really just to get all the emotion and all the venting of the chest and, and getting to know the client. And then here by the second and third um, sessions, we really talk about what are your values? What's important to you in life? What is, if you could have any job or anything, what is it that you would do? And then see how we can tie that back into either your study or using leveraging some of the PhD skills that you picked up. Even may you might not go back into they say science, but you might go into the business world. What are the skills that you learned during your PhD PhD journey? So project management is definitely there. Being able to handle feedback. Um, if you're going into the business world, it's really just as tough. It's really tough. Being able to present. I know PhD students present their topics at little bit of like student forums or they have like a, a journal club that they have to present little bits and pieces and also sometimes they have to stand in front of a whole panel of academics and present so that is an amazing skill especially in the business world if you can talk it doesn't matter to who it, who's in the room with all the titles with all the professor titles and all those things and you can still deliver that is a very very good skill to have so just even though you don't want to use the PhD to get a specific scientific job out of it. There are skills that you can take, but trying to get into what are those skills and why would they be important to, to continue? So in a nutshell, so basically working on your values, who you are, 
looking at what it is that you want, what it is that you can see yourself in five years or something like that, and then working from how do we get there. Okay, so so basically um, it's setting the foundation and then working from there on the mm -hmm. career goals. Yes, and, and often I do get, I get uh, clients that approach me for very specific topics. So then, again, you, you would work on it, but you first need to lay that foundation and then go. So if it's just, I would like to get a job by the end of the year. Okay, great, fine. What, is it, what type of jobs are you looking for? What are you good at? What does your CV say? How does your CV even look? <laughs> and then getting to like the support structure, getting maybe other people involved to help with CV creation or, or, or maybe go and talk to networks or join some networks. There's a lot of online forums and things. Um, and then that's where my divergent thinking comes in is really going and exploring the possibilities. And then at the end of the day, making the decision when you converge. And that's true. A lot of graduates, I guess, are not 100% sure initially what they can do because they think that they are um, kind of boxed into one idea. But there is a whole array of possibilities for everyone, especially if you are in science. Definitely. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liesl. So uh, where people can find you? Well, um, I think I'm, I believe I'm uh, on your website. And, um, but other than that, I am on LinkedIn. And also, um, I do have a website where I've got an online booking system. So what's quite nice is that the, the first session, I call it discovery session, it is free. 30 minutes just to get to know each other, see if that is there is a bit of synergy and um, and if I am the coach that can help you. So the thing is, is that choosing a coach that really suits you is quite important. Um, otherwise, yeah, coaching might not be as as fun or as as empowering as you want it. So it's really choosing the coach that really gels with you and you you really do have a connection with. That's very, very important. So the discovery session is free and yeah, I'm online. You can online on Calendly, Calendly slash Shapeshifter and yeah, you book a slot. Okay, great. So I'll definitely include those links uh, with this video. And at the same time, as you mentioned, you are on the website of Science Bridge. So you can contact us on Science Bridge and we'll definitely connect, connect you with the clients. Well, thank you so much, Liesl. Do you have any final advice that you would give to our viewers about coaching? Well, I must say, I think, Martina, I have to say that I'm quite proud of what you've created. Um, it was really, it was such a privilege to be part of your journey and see how Science Bridge unfolded. And um, yeah, I can I just wish you good luck. And I can tell you now, this is an amazing platform for students to really get the support that they need. So I would definitely suggest students watching this, get a coach that helps you through the journey. But at the end of the day, you become a more empowered individual at the end of the day. Thank you so much for that. And have, for having me. <laughs> thank you.